What's up, guys? Hope you're doing well. Um, miss seeing you guys. And uh, by now we are finishing, uh, we're done with chapter 12. We have chapter 13 to go. We're going to get as much of it as we can in before the uh, the final bell rings. But I know we can get through the majority of trig identities and then maybe even get some graphing uh, trig functions in there, which, um, which are not too bad. Uh, fortunately for you guys, um, at least this year, we're not going to look at uh, proving trig identities, which is one of the, which is one of the tougher things we do. Um, we'll have to cover that next year, and uh, so it'll be the first time you see it next year. But after having absorbed some of these trig identities, it might be a little bit easier for you. So we're going to jump in today and talk about where these identities come from, talk about how to do some basic simplifying with these identities, and then we are uh, just going to progress uh, through the uh, through the beginning of May looking at the different kinds of identities. Another thing that's a plus for you is I normally give a bunch of identities quizzes. Like every day or every other day, I give a quiz based on a certain number of the trig identities. Well, because everything's open notes, uh, I don't know how, how that's gonna work out. So we may have, just check your assignment sheet um, for any extra little quizzes or homework assignments I might have you turn in. Uh, make sure you're looking at that. I, I usually post those on the calendar as well as a reminder. Um, but make sure you're following that assignment sheet. It gives you all the, the dates that are due, um, any assignment that's due. But um, anyway, we're going to jump into that trig identities now and uh, and see how it treats us. All right. Oh, yeah, I keep forgetting to, uh, to give you another lame dad joke. So um, here's one for you. Uh, what sound does a witch's car make? Broom, broom. All right, guys, so real quickly, I want to run through these trig identities and um, hopefully get somewhere as far as um, helping you understand where they come from. And I've, I've put in, in, in your Schoology page as a copy of, of the trig identities that you ultimately you really need to know them. You need I, I normally give quizzes over all of these identities, but because these tests are open notes kind of defeats the point of of trying to do that. Um, I may. Um, but the app, so we're going to have to focus on the applications. And some people hated those quizzes. Uh, a lot of people loved them because they would do really well on them. It was like getting a, you know, a nice high A on a test grade, a major test grade by the time you added all five of them together. But you guys are going to have to just rely on homework and tests, which hopefully you'll be fine on. So I want to show you where these come from. You're not going to have to do any of these proofs um, at all. But um, a lot of people are like, what the heck? Why, for instance, is tan squared theta plus one equals secant squared theta. And actually, I believe in one of the classes we went over this, we, we ran out of time towards uh, prior to getting dismissed from uh, school um, before Pi Day, so I never got a chance to catch back up with the other class. So I'm just gonna go back over it again. So the first group of identities, and by the way, uh, these are considered uh, part of the fundamental identities. These are your basic um, identities that you definitely need to have to know for AP Calculus. Um, we're going to be covering those today, and then we're going to get into the slightly uglier ones like the the alpha plus beta or the sum and difference identities and the double angles and the half angles, and, and we'll get into other identities even beyond that next year. So if I were you, I'd memorize these because you're going to need to know them, um, but fortunately for you on this test, you, you can actually pull them out since it's open notes and use them. Okay, so let's just start with a regular old triangle. I'm going to label it X, Y, and R. So you know that the Pythagorean Pythagorean theorem says that x squared plus y squared is r squared, and you can see that I have written a form of that right there. I switched the x and the y for, uh, for really only just so my identities would look a certain way at the end, but it doesn't really matter. x squared plus y squared is r squared or vice, vice versa there. And I wrote it three times because there are three Pythagorean identities, and they come from the Pythagorean theorem relationship here. Okay, now, right here, on this particular one, I just randomly, and you'll see it's not as random as you might think, but I randomly just decided to defy, divide both sides by r squared. And you know when I divide an entire side by r squared that's adding, I can put the r squared under each part. So that's what I've done here. And on the middle one, I divided both sides by an x squared. And on the far right one, both sides by a y squared. And at first glance, you might go, why is he doing this? Well, then I decided to rewrite each one of these fractions as y over r quantity squared. And we know that's okay because squaring a fraction means squaring the top and the bottom, and this and this are the same thing. And I went ahead and did that with this fraction, 
This one canceled and left me one. Over here, I went and did that with this fraction. The X's cancel and leaves me a one. I did it with this fraction. And then over here, the Y's cancel and leave me one. And then I rewrote this as X over Y squared and R over Y quantity squared. Now, once I get to there, I'm looking at this Y and this R and this X and this R, which show up, or the R and the X and the R over Y. I look at all of these different values and I think, you know, if I'm dealing with a theta, what trig function would have given me Y over R? And if I'm dealing with this theta, Y over R would be the sine of that theta. So I'm gonna replace y over r with the sine of theta. And then as we've talked about, if you've forgotten, no worries, but we don't write sine of theta squared like this. We write it as sine squared theta, but they mean exactly the same thing. I gotta be honest with you, I like the way that looks better. I think that you as a young mathematician would probably do better with this, but you've gotta understand moving forward in your math, uh, in your math career, I guess, you've got to be able to understand that that and that are synonymous and we write it like this. Okay, now, then I get to the X over R. Well, in terms of theta, what is X over R? That's adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, that's cosine of theta. So I'm going to replace that with a cosine of theta and then cosine of theta squared is the same thing as cosine squared theta. And then the one just drops down and that is my first Pythagorean identity. Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. Now, over here, you might notice y over x. Well, what is op in terms of theta, what is opposite over adjacent? Well, that's tangent. So I'm going to replace the y over x with a tangent of theta. Take the square and basically write it as tan squared theta. The one just drops down. And then what's r over x? Well, we know that with theta, x over r is cosine. Well, then r over x is the reciprocal of that, which would be secant. And again, secant squared theta. Over here, x over y. Well, if y over x is tangent in terms of theta, then x over y is cotangent. So I'm gonna replace that with a cotangent, swing the squared in. And then finally, r over y. Well, if y over r with respect to theta is sine, then r over y is the reciprocal of sine or cosecant of theta. And then I bring the squared in. So these are my three Pythagorean ther theorems, um, Pythagorean identities. And by the way, they don't have to be written like this. Like I could switch the order of that, but I could also do something like, what if I took this cosine squared and subtracted it from the other side? Then I would have one minus cosine squared theta equals sine theta. Well, that's another trig identity that fits this mold. What if I subtracted the sine squared to the, to the right? That would give me one minus sine squared is cosine squared. 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared. That's a trig identity. I mean, I could subtract the 1 over and subtract the cosine squared over. That's another trig identity. I can do lots of different things with these, but if you're wondering if it fits this mold, like, for instance, if you're wondering whether, uh, dang it, those two were what I just talked about. I said if I were to subtract cosine squared over, I would get sine squared equals 1 minus cosine squared or if I were to subtract sine squared to this side from both sides, it would cancel and give me cosine squared is one minus sine squared. There it is, cosine squared is one minus sine squared. But I could also do things like keep the sine where it is, subtract one from both sides, and then subtract cosine squared, negative cosine squared theta from both sides. Well, that's another trig identity. So there's lots of them that you could form just from that. If you're ever wondering if something like this is an identity, well, then just add that over and add that over and see if it matches. Same thing here. I could subtract one from the other side and I could get tangent squared equals secant squared minus one. All right. I could subtract the secant squared to the left. All right. Subtract it from both sides. It would end up over here and then subtract one from both sides and it would end up looking like this. Well, guess what? That is a trig identity that I've written down here. Okay, tangent squared theta minus secant squared theta equals negative one, all right? And if I multiply through by a negative one, I get negative tan squared theta plus secant squared theta equals positive one. There's another one. So you can see I can come up with all kinds of different identities by just adding and subtracting based on these original three. But those are the core trig identities that you have to know. Like you might run into a problem later and you might see something like, cosecant squared theta minus one. 
And I might tell you to simplify this. And you might go, what do you mean simplify? Well, is there a way to write this which is a little more compact? Well, you recognize the cosecant squared as being in a, in a Pythagorean identity. You recognize that one is in there as well. And you think, wait, if I were to subtract one from both sides, I get cosecant squared theta minus one is cotangent squared theta. So that simplifies to cotangent squared theta, which is a much neater version of, the, of this. Well, not much neater, but somewhat neater. Okay, are you kind of following me? Okay, so anyway, these are the first three Pythagorean, or the first three fundamental identities. We call them Pythagorean identities. Okay, now the next group of identities I want to look at are called cofunction identities. And I believe I actually went through these with one of my classes as well, and uh, but not the other one. Uh, we got a little bit um, off. And by the way, these are on page 35 and 36 in the book. Okay. And, uh, and if you look at your assignment sheet, by the way, some things are uh, like they're higher paged, uh, like page 360 or 500 or whatever. If you see really higher pages, those are your textbook. But if I'm using the book, I will mention that it is in the book. All right. Now, a couple things here. I'm giving you this triangle again with X, Y, and R. But this time, I not only called that theta, but I'm going to call this beta. All right, and I want you to notice a couple things. The first thing is, if I were to ask you what the sine of theta is, you would go, oh, the sine of that would be the opposite over hypotenuse, and you'd write y over r. Well, then if I saunter over here and ask you what's the cosine of beta, you go, oh, cosine of that is adjacent over hypotenuse, so also y over r. Well, what that means is, if they're both y over r, then the sine of the theta must be equal to the cosine of the beta, right? Now, what is beta? Well, beta and theta have to add to 180. So if theta plus beta add to one, sorry, theta plus beta plus 90 add to 180, theta plus beta add, just to add to the remaining 90. Well, if that's true, then your theta is 90 minus beta. So what that means is I can take my 90 minus beta, plug it in there, and I get a new identity. Now, a lot of people go, what's the point of having this identity? Well, this identity lets you change sines and cosines from one angle to another. Like for instance, what if I said, what is the sine of 25? If I told you the sine of 25 and I wanted it to be a cosine, I could change it to cosine by using 90 minus that 25. And we know that 90 minus 25 degrees gives me cosine of what? That's right, cosine of 65. So the sine of 25 and the cosine of 65 would be equal. And that's not just true for sine and cosine, it's true for tangent and cotangent, cotangent and tangent, secant and cosecant, cosecant and secant, all right? And by the way, it's cosine and sine. These are the reason why they're called the co-function identities because they're sine and cosine. Tan, uh, tangent and cotangent, uh, tangent and cotangent, secant and cosecant, right? The functions that have this relationship where the trig function of one is equal to the co-trig function of its complement, those are co-function identities. So if I throw something like secant of 12 and say, what is it equal to? Well, secant and co secant are related because the secant of one is the cosecant of 90 minus the other, which gives me 78 degrees. And you'll notice these two are complements of each other, just like theta and beta were complements of each other. All right. So those are your co-function identities. And by the way, I don't always use 90 degrees. We're going to start with 90 because I know you guys tend to think a little bit better in Algebra 2 dealing with degrees. But by the time we hit calculus, we have to be able to think in radians because we don't even use the, the angle measurement of degrees. So 90 minus theta, same thing goes for pi over 2 because that's 90, pi over 2 minus theta. All right, so if I ever said something like tangent of pi over 4 is equal to cotangent of, well, I'm not going to go 90 minus pi over 4 because 90 is a degree and that's a radian. So I will go pi over two minus pi over four. Are you with me? 90 minus that. So how do you figure that out? Well, I would have to find a common denominator, right? A common denominator of pi over two would be 
2 pi over 4, and then I would subtract pi over 4, and I would get cotangent of pi over 4. All right? So in this case, they happen to be the same, but that makes sense, right? Because that's like 45 degrees, and so is that. All right, one more before I move on from this. What if I gave you something like secant of pi over 6 is cosecant of blank? Well, because they're co-functions of each other, I could say not 90, but pi over 2 minus pi over 6, right? And then to simplify that, I would have to find a common denominator. So I'm going to change, I'm going to find that common denominator, which is 3 pi over 6, and I'm going to subtract pi over 6. And what do I get? 2 pi over 6. You with me? 3 pi over 6 minus pi over 6 is 2 pi over 6, which is pi over 3. So the secant pi over 6 would be equal to the cosecant, cosecant of pi over 3. All right, which kind of makes sense because that's like a 30 degree angle and that's a 60 degree angle and 30 and 60 are complements. All right, so those are your co-function identities and co-function identities, again, are called co-functions because it's sine and cosine or secant and cosecant or cotangent and tangent, okay, because they have, they share that co-relationship. All right. So anyway, those are co-function identities. Those are part of the fundamental identities, which is why I'm including them here. And then the last thing I want to talk about um, on these, in addition to the uh, trig identities that we already know, you know what you know what sine is and what cosine is and that kind of stuff, um, are the even and odd identities. Now you learned uh, about even and odd a while ago, very briefly, but you learned when we were dealing with um, the basic functions you learned that even function had this definition. And if you think back to the def definition, it'll make more sense if I write it out for you, but what it means is opposite values of x, right? If I have opposite x values, the y values of them are equal. So f of negative x equals f of x. Those are even. And the way that looks like on a graph, what that looks like on a graph is I'll do even over here. Think about that. Opposite x values, right? So if I had graph with opposite x's, I'm going to have the same y's. So if I had x values of like negative 2 and 2, the y values are the same. If I have x values of negative 1 and 1, the y values are the same. If I have x values of negative 4 and 4, the y values are the same. Now I'm making up these y values, but what do you end up seeing once you look at the graph, you end up seeing that even functions have what? Y-axis symmetry, okay? Well, there are trig functions that are even functions also, but not many, okay? Just two of them. And you're gonna learn how to graph these later and it'll make totally good sense. But the two trig functions that are even are the cosine and the secant, which means for you, if, and this is the definition, right? Opposite, opposite x values, the y values are equal. Opposite, so basically opposite angles, the trig function of those opposite angles would be equal. Well, that means to you that something like cosine of 30 should be equal to cosine of negative 30. Well, let's think about it. We know that cosine of 30, to think about the unit circle there, we're gonna go over a lot, up a little, and cosine is the x value, so over a lot. Now, negative 30 is actually down 30, but that's the same thing as a positive 330. So think about what's happening at positive 330. Well, again, I'm going over a lot, but this time down a little. Cosine's the x, so over a lot. And you could see that the cosine of negative 30 gave me the same value as cosine of 30. Well, what that means to you is, not that I can simplify it like this, what it means to you is if you're ever given something like, um, like cosine of negative 12 degrees, that you could basically just rewrite it as cosine at, of 12 degrees, or vice versa if you wanted to. But most of the time we're trying to simplify, so now you know that something like this could be written like that. So really, it's like you could just throw the negative away, but only with cosine and secant can you do that. Okay, so with cosine and secant, basically, if you have a cosine or secant of a negative angle, then you can throw the negative away and just use the positive angle, which is kind of nice. Now, all the rest of them are odd functions. On an odd function, 
this was our definition for odd. For odd, it said opposite values of X did not give you the same Y, they gave you opposite Y's. Well, if they're opposite, if this Y and this Y are opposite, then I would have to negate one of them in order for them to be equal. Well, that's just saying that a function of a negative X is equal to negative function of X. That's the definition of odd. Well, look, a function of negative eight theta is equal to the negative function of theta. Well, that's true for all of the other functions. They're all odd. And odd trig functions, when you go to graph them, you find that this is what the graph looks like. All right, and th these aren't trig functions that I've been graphing right here, but this means opposite X's, you get opposite Y's. Opposite X's, right here, opposite Y's. Opposite X's, you get opposite Y's. And what do you end up having when you're done? You end up getting what we call origin symmetry. Where remember you can spin it. Like if you took this thing right here and put a nail right there and just spun this 180 degrees, this side would be up here, this side would be down here, barring any bad graphing I've done here, a little bit off. Um, but these are called origin symmetry because you could spin them 180 degrees about the origin, it looks exactly the same. Well, all these four trig functions, you can do that. But what does it mean to you? If you're ever asked to find a sine of a negative angle, it's almost like you can just factor the negative to the outside. And you can do that with, all, with everything but secant and cosecant. I'm sorry, with secant and, and uh, cosine. Secant and cosine, throw the negative away. Cosecant sine, tangent, cotangent, factor the negative out to the front. And that's, it's not really factoring, but that's the net result of this, okay? So here's an example, and listen, I'm making this stuff hard, but just to give you an example. Secant of negative 60, well, remember, secant and cosine, I can just throw the negative away, and then I don't have to worry about dealing with the negative angle. I can go, oh, well, what's secant at 60 degrees? And I can go to my unit circle, I know at 60 degrees, I'm over a little up a lot, right? And the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine, so I'm gonna take the x and flip it. There it is, All right? Or if I'm dealing with something like tangent, tangent at negative 60, well, I can't throw the negative away, but I could factor it out to the front and just wait on it. So now I could just kind of ignore the negative for now. What's the tangent at 60? Well, tangent is y over x. So I can take that, put it over that, the two, right? If I take root three over two, put it over a half, the twos in the denominator cancel and I get root three, but don't forget that negative. I can just bring the negative over and get a negative root three. Now, if you're thinking, why don't you just use negative 60? Well, that's fine. I'm, again, that would be one half negative root three over two. And if I do that, I don't even have to worry about the negative, right? I just go to here and I end up with negative root three. But I'm just showing you what these identities are capable of and what you can do with them, okay? Um, anyway, and then at the very bottom of this, I just showed you anytime you do have a negative angle, you can always add 360 to it and just use the positive version. That's always an option if you don't really wanna use, or if you forget the even and odd identity. Um, this is always an option and you could use this in this place. All right, so those are your identities. Um, tonight, you're gonna be seeing all kinds of of just random problems. And I'm gonna go through some examples that you might see in your book uh, in a couple of seconds. All right, so in your book, you're asked to do uh, numbers one through 47 odd in your homework tomorrow. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and do some of the even problems and, uh, and just show you that most of what you're asked tonight is not gonna be overwhelming, but it's what you're doing is simplifying a trig identity. So the first one I'm talking about, this is number two. And the, all the directions for all of these is to simplify. I'm not gonna keep writing simplify over and over again, but those are the directions. And I know that you're used to thinking simplify as PEMDAS. It's a little bit different when it comes to this, but essentially what you're trying to do is make this consolidate and look a little bit more cleaned up, okay? So the first problem you're asked to simplify is the cosine of theta times the cosecant of theta. Okay, now, we actually have some identities that we have not gone over today, but that you already know. And one of them is a reciprocal identity. And one of the identity that you know is that the cosecant of an angle is the same thing as one over the sine of an angle. And you know that, right? 
And this is on that identities page that I've re-included in, in Schoology there, in the trig identities. You'll see a file of that if you want to pull it up. So what, I, what that means is I can take this cosecant and replace it with one over sine. Right? So I'm going to replace it with one over sine of theta. And then when I multiply, I get cosine of theta over sine of theta. Well, that's an identity. We learned prior to all of this that cotangent was the cosine divided by the sine. That was an identity that we've had. So if cosine divided by sine is the same thing as cotangent, then I can replace that with the cotangent of theta, which means this can be better written as just that. And that's an example of simplifying a trig identity. All right, so let's look at number four. All right, and the more you do these, the better off you're gonna feel about them. Number four is the cosine of angle T, and they're just gonna use different variables, don't let that bother you, divided by the cotangent of angle T. Okay, now I don't recognize that, but I do know that cotangent is of an angle, right? is defined as one over the tangent of an angle. They're reciprocals, right? Or you could think a cotangent on the top of a fraction is the same as a tangent on the bottom. Well, guess what? A tangent on the top is the same thing as a cotangent on the bottom. And I can go all day, a cotangent on the bottom is the same thing as a tangent, in the, and I'm saying top and bottom, denominator, numerator, right? Or a tangent in the denominator is the same thing as a cotangent in the numerator. Well, there's, those are reciprocal identities. So the hard way of going about number four is to actually leave the cosine where it is and take that and write in its place the reciprocal identity, which would be one over tan, right? But what is a function divided by a fraction? Well, it is the same thing as a function times the reciprocal of that, which is, and by the way, I shouldn't have put a theta in there, it's angle T. It's tangent of angle T. Well, if you think about what I just did, I took that cotangent in the denominator and made it a tangent in the numerator. That's like taking the reciprocal. That's like using this reciprocal identity. Okay, this is technically a cotangent in the denominator, right? It becomes a tangent in the numerator. So I could have skipped this step and gone just brought that up, made it a tangent. Now, now I have cosine t times tangent of t. That doesn't really look a whole lot better, but wait. What is tangent equal to? Tangent's equal to sine of t over cosine of t, right? Just like we said earlier, that cotangent was cosine over sine, well, that would have to mean that tangent is sine over cosine, sine of the angle over cosine of the angle. Those are reciprocals. These would have to be reciprocals too. So back to this, look what happens. My cosine t's cancel, and I'm left with sine of angle t, okay? Now, is that the only way to do this? No. What I also could have done right here it's just immediately, check it out, I'm gonna leave that there, immediately change cotangent to cosine t over sine t. And then again, how do you divide by a fraction? You leave the numerator there and you multiply by the reciprocal. So this would have been, again, another way to do it and I could have simplified it. And you're gonna find out, guys, that there are often dozens of ways that you can simplify this. Please don't think that what they're doing in the textbook is always the right way to do it. Um, if you don't get something right, feel free to check out the videos at any point and kind of make sure that you're good. Okay, um, I'm going to jump to number six. All right, number six is um, it's a little uglier looking and it says secant of, we say phi here in America, but most other countries pronounce that phi. Um, the, Greek, the Greeks pronounce it phi, I believe, um, but we say phi, uh, and it's a lowercase phi. The uppercase uh, has a capital I with that in it. Lowercase almost looks like a null set looking sign. All right, so here's my trig identity. I don't recognize that. 
um, for anything that I've seen. Um, but when I look at that, I think, huh, the only identity that I even know that has a secant in it, other than the reciprocal identity with secant and cosine is, is this one. Do you remember this one? We proved it earlier. Tangent squared theta plus one equals secant squared theta. Well, when I see that, I go, huh, secant squared theta. And this right here would be secant squared if I multiplied it. Let's see what happens. So if I FOIL this out, because those are like conjugates, I do get a secant phi, uh, phi times a secant phi is a secant squared phi. And then the outside, outside, inside, inside cancel. And then I'm left with a negative one. And look, secant squared minus one. Well, look, if I base that on this original trig identity and I subtract one from both sides, what does secant squared theta minus one equal? It's equal to tangent squared theta, isn't it? So secant squared phi minus one must be equal to tangent squared phi. And that is much cleaner looking than all of this. Now you may look at this and go, how on earth would I know that? Well, you really have to know your identities well. For you guys, you don't have to have them memorized this year, but you will next. You really need to know these well and, and, and kind of have in your head, wait a minute, the only one that has a secant in it is that trig identity right there or this one. Secant theta is one over cosine theta, but I thought, you know, changing that to one over cosine and that to one over cosine, I didn't think, it didn't make me think of anything special, so I didn't do it. All right, let's check out number eight. All right, so number eight over here. Uh, number eight says cotangent of T, uh, and then it has secant of T, angle T, and then it has sine of angle T. Well, I, you know, I look at this and I go, well, gosh, none of this even, these aren't even reciprocals of each other, right? Secant's a reciprocal of cosine and cotangent's reciprocal of tangent. So you know what I, one strategy, if I'm like stumped and I really don't know what to do, a lot of times I'll just rewrite everything in terms of sines and cosines because every trig function can be written in terms of a sine and a cosine. Check it out. Cotangent of an angle is the same thing as, and we've already talked about that today, the cosine of the angle over the sine of the angle. And then secant and cosine are reciprocals. So secant of T is one over cosine of T and then sine's already written in terms of sine and cosine. And I get down to here and what do I see? Look, those cancel, those cancel, which turns out that this was just a fancy way of writing the number one. Who knew? All right, now look at number 10. Number 10, these are starting to look a little uglier. All right, number 10 says cosecant of X divided by sine of X. And then I'm gonna subtract cotangent of X divided by tangent of X. And this tells me to simplify this. Well, now according to simplify, the normal simplify, PEMDAS means to parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, and subtract. And when I look at this subtraction problem, I think, well, the only way I can subtract these is to find a common denominator. And right now I do not have a common denominator. And my thought is, you know what? I really don't want to have a common denominator of sine x tangent x. That's going to be a pretty brutal mess. Although I could get there that way, it's going to be ugly. So I'm going to do like I did in number eight. I'm going to change all of these to sines and cosines. And when I do that, I think I might be in good shape. So let's take a look. Cosecant. Now I'm going to take a little sidebar up here. Do you know, remember how cosecant of x is the reciprocal with sine of x? So that means a cosecant in the numerator can become a sine of x in the denominator. So I'm gonna take that cosecant and I'm gonna change it to a sine of x down there in the denominator, which leaves nothing left in the numerator and it leaves sine x sine x in the denominator, which is sine squared x. Hopefully you're with me on that. I'm changing that to a sine in the denominator and then multiply them together. Now, I know that cotangent, I'm just gonna do this, is the same thing as a cosine of x over a sine of x. And I know that tangent is the same thing as a sine of x over a cosine of x. And now I have a fraction divided by a fraction. So I'm gonna copy this left part down. And then how do I take this top part and divide it by the bottom part? Well, you leave the top part where it is and to divide by a fraction, you multiply by its reciprocal. 
So I'm gonna take that, multiply by the reciprocal, that goes away, now what do I have? Well, now I have cosine squared x over sine squared x, and look, uh, you've got a common denominator. So I didn't even have to do a whole lot else once I changed it to sines and cosines. And again, changing everything to sines and cosines is a pretty good idea when you're stumped, okay? Now at this point, I have a common denominator, so I can combine it using that one denominator by just combining the numerator. So one minus cosine squared. Now, some people stop, especially early on right here. But wait, I recognize there's a trig identity that has a cosine squared and a one in it. Here it is, it's sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. Well, is there any way this and this are related? Yeah, look what happens if I subtract the cosine over. If I move the cosine over, I get minus cosine squared on the other side. And that's what I have right here. Well, if that's what I have, then I can replace all of that with the sine squared. And what does that leave me? Sine squared X over sine squared X, which is one. So again, all of that was another fancy way of writing the number one. All right. Okay, I'm gonna look at number 12. And uh, I'm not gonna continue to do every single one of these. I'm just trying to help you um, kind of get the idea. And then you do the best you can on all these. Um, I'm looking at number 12 right now. All right, number 12 says secant of t over cosine of t minus secant of t times cosine of t. Well, I look at this and honestly, I don't even know. So what I'm gonna do is go, you know, to subtract these, I would have to have a common denominator. I really don't have any great ideas other than, you know what, secant is a reciprocal with cosine. So because secant of an angle is one over cosine of an angle, a secant in the numerator could be a cosine in the denominator or vice versa. So I'm gonna take that secant in the numerator and I'm gonna make it a cosine t in the denominator along with the ones that's already there. So I'm basically replacing it with one over cosine t. What's that leave me? One over cosine squared t. Now what happens here? Here, I'm gonna take that secant that's in the numerator and I'm gonna put it down and make it a cosine t in the denominator, okay? Now, this is what I have. Now, for those of you that cancel that out, you're gonna have a one there and you're gonna go, what do I do? Well, if you do cancel it out and you have a one there, how do you, how do you take that and subtract a one? You find a common denominator. So you would change that one to cosine squared t over cosine squared t. What I have is already a cosine t over a cosine t if I don't cancel. So I just need to put another cosine on the top and I need to put another cosine on the bottom. And, um, and if I do that, a cosine on the top and a cosine on the bottom, that will give me cosine squared and cosine squared. So literally I'm multiplying the top and the bottom by a cosine of T. And by the way, why can I multiply the top and the bottom by a cosine of T? Because that's equal to one and it doesn't change my value just the way it looks. And look, once again, I have a common denominator. So keep the denominator. There's your numerator, one minus cosine squared of t. And oh my gosh, just like the last problem, what's one minus cosine squared of an angle equal to? Sine squared of the angle. We just did that on the last problem. And then you can see that right here. What's sine squared over cosine squared? Well, probably makes sense if sine of an angle over cosine of an angle is tangent of an angle, then shouldn't sine squared over cosine squared be tangent squared since you just have two of them? So this becomes a tangent squared of the angle. All right. All right, at this point, I'm just gonna kind of jump around a little bit. Um, how about let's jump to 14? Well, that's not a big jump, that's in order. Uh, 14's not gonna take us much time. 14 gave me one plus tangent squared theta over one plus cotangent squared theta. Well, wait, those are two uh, Pythagorean identities. We know that one plus tangent squared is secant squared, and we know that one plus cotangent squared is cosecant squared. And isn't a secant in the numerator the same thing as a cosine in the denominator? But if it's squared, both of them can come down. And isn't a cosecant in the denominator the same thing as a sine in the numerator, and since there's two of them there, there's two of them here, 
And then once again, just like number 12, what's sine over cosine? Tangent. And since there's two sines and two cosines, there's two tangent thetas, so tangent squared. All right, how about, um, look at 16. 16 is not quite as bad, but it says one plus tangent squared 50. Now we, could, we don't know what tangent of 50 is, so we certainly don't know what tangent of 50 squared is, but wait a minute, isn't that really the same identity that I had here? And one plus tangent squared of theta is secant squared of theta, that's a Pythagorean identity. So shouldn't one plus tangent squared of 50 be secant squared of 50? Now, if I had a calculator, I could clean that up. But without a calculator, I don't know what secant of 50 is. That's not a special angle. So I would just stop right there. All right, what about 18? 18, I guess I'm not skipping much at all. Uh, here I have secant squared of 350 degrees minus tangent squared of 350 degrees. Well, do you have any trig functions that have secant squared and tangent squared? Well, as a matter of fact, check it out. Tangent squared plus one is secant squared, isn't it? And according to that, it doesn't matter. It's just true as long as the angels, angles match. Well, what would happen if I subtracted a tangent to the other side? Wouldn't I have secant squared theta minus tangent squared theta? Dang it. That's a, that's a Pythagorean identity, right? If I subtract that to the other side, don't I have this? And isn't that what I have right there? Now the angles are 350. This says it's always equal to one as long as those thetas match. Well, they match. So all of this is equal to one. All right, so anyway, guys, I hope you're seeing the idea here. Um, and, uh, and you can do the best you can on all of these. Um, I think you'll be okay. If not, make sure you check the key and, uh, and maybe watch the video. Um, of any solutions that I offer up and just make sure you can always scroll through those to the ones you might have missed. And remember this too, guys, if you end up with the same amount on these, the same value, you've done it correctly. If you go about it a different way, that's okay. And sometimes you're going to go about it a different way and make a small careless error. It doesn't mean your way is wrong. It just means you made a careless error along the way, or maybe you didn't go quite as far. And I will go ahead and throw this out here too. Generally speaking, you don't want to end up with a fraction, right? You don't want to end up with stuff that, like, I don't want to end up with something like tangent of negative theta when I have an identity that says I could factor the negative out, okay? I don't want to end up with something like 1 minus sine squared of theta, sine squared of theta, when I can rewrite it as cosine squared of theta. So you want to clean it up as much as possible. Let today be a learning experience for you. And, uh, and tomorrow when you're working on the homework. And uh, again, make, make sure you check and correct your answers. Your test is gonna have a lot of this stuff on here, more than normal, since I'm having to cut out some things because it's an open notes test. So you're gonna have to be able to think through this stuff um, pretty well. All right, good luck guys, and I'll see you next time.